Shout out to Otis, linked below, for sponsoring today's video. We'll even be talking about CryptoPunks with Otis. Hey everyone, me Kevin here. In this video, we're going to talk about various different updates regarding uh, cryptocurrencies. We're going to talk about price action that we're seeing. We're going to talk about some updates regarding what happened in Singapore. We'll talk about and crypto as an inflation hedge. We'll also talk about Myanmar, uh, Bloomberg's price target for crypto, what happened with Solana. Uh, but more importantly, the broader market, what's happening with the broader market. These are all things we're going to cover in this video. So if you're curious about what the heck is going on in the crypto world, here's the update for you uh, for December 13th. Quick note, because so many you've been asking, there is now a Christmas coupon code for all of the programs on building your wealth, whether it's in real estate, stocks, the psychology of money, investing, real estate agents, making YouTube videos, you name it. Check out the link in the description down below and use that before Christmas. Okay, folks, let's get right into this. We'll go ahead and first uh, just get a quick little preview of the day. Look at this, folks. Bitcoin just dropped below 47,000. Ethereum is now below 3,800. Uh, and so far, we have seen nothing but this slip trend continue. If we drop on over or jump on over rather to uh, our Weeble here, we can see generally we keep revisiting this 47,100-ish line uh, for BTC. I do have a double set of supports here drawn, a softer one and a stronger one. The stronger one is that 47.1 level and 46.8 uh, is the softer one. This is really where we see sort of that pain extending. And right now we're, we're bouncing off of this again at 47.1 here, bouncing around again. You see the price over here. So these very, very, very important lines here. This is on the one hour chart. If we go out to the one day, uh, you could see the pain that we've kind of been playing with right here. So it's a little less evident on the one day chart, but on the one hour chart, you could definitely see that uh, these have been holding. When we get larger liquidations, that's when we get these pull throughs. Uh, but even if we go back a little bit, uh, we see some of these uh, same levels come into play, like at the beginning of October. Uh, and of course, if we jump in over here towards where we've been playing uh, since about the beginning of December, we could see these lines pretty, pretty consistent. Uh, similarly with Ethereum, except Ethereum breaking past its 4K level. And when we break past the Ethereum 4K level, we do have a support line at 3764. And that's essentially what we're stretching down to right now. And we just bounced off of that sitting at about 38. So watch that in terms of levels. Now, in terms of uh, Cardano, worth noting that we so far, and it's unfortunate, we've been pretty much perfectly following the Fibonacci write down. And it wouldn't surprise me at all to see Cardano get back to about a buck oh two. This is where in the summer I did a substantial amount of buying on Cardano and it ended up being a phenomenal investment because the thing almost tripled. Actually, it did triple. I didn't sell for a triple, I sold for a double, but I'll take it. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is one to watch. She Sheeb did a lot of a similar move here with the Fibonacci, so watch for that uh, similar retracement that we're seeing here. Now, let's go ahead and talk about some of the news. This is a little bit of the price action that's been going on. Let's talk about some of the news and try to make sense of some of the madness that's going on. So uh, in order to do this, I think it's easier for us to just hop on over to our, uh, our outline over here, it's just easiest to flow. And a lot of you seem to appreciate the outline. So first, it's worth noting that 90% of Bitcoin has been mined as of today. So congratulations. That doesn't mean the next 10% is going to be the hardest coin that has ever been mined, but it is a big milestone for Bitcoin. Uh, also, Binance. Uh, Binance had an application to run an exchange in Singapore. They uh, Bloomberg just reported that they have withdrawn their application to operate an exchange in Singapore. They'll wind down down and close operations for this particular branch by February 13th of 2022. Uh, this was originally, Singapore was speculated to become the global headquarters for Binance. So it came as a little bit of a surprise. Some folks are indicating that maybe this is why we're seeing crypto sell down a little bit. Now, Binance later came out and said, hey, look, they have an 18% percent stake in the HG exchange which operates in that region. Uh, and that kind of made their application, quote, somewhat redundant. And they ended the message on Twitter with onwards, which in my opinion, when you kind of end a message with onwards, it's kind of like you're kind of rolling your eyes like, ah, well, it wasn't meant to be, I guess, and you're kind of moving on, which kind of implies that they wanted the permit, 
but still withdrew the permit for some reason. And, and this kind of reiterates not only the regulatory difficulties that, that we face, but the regulatory uncertainties that we face. It's kind of like what we heard in the congressional hearings uh, about, hey, should we have a single regulator? Should we have multi-regulators uh, versus uh, having nothing? You know, should we just use the regulatory regimes that we have now or stick with nothing? And, and really the worst is having nothing. And that's kind of what we have now is very little crypto regulation. And that makes it very difficult to jump through hoops because you don't know what the hoops are supposed to be when you're trying to apply for things like, for example, a Bitcoin ETF, I'm not talking about a Bitcoin futures ETF, an actual Bitcoin ETF. Like if we just got, hey, if you follow these rules, you can provide lending services, Coinbase. Hey, if you follow these rules, you can have a stable coin. If you follow these rules, you can you have an ETF. Great. Then, then at least it gives us a path. But we don't even have that path right now. And so that's where Congress is lost uh, in, in trying to regulate crypto. And honestly, I don't think they even remotely understand it. But then again, I think the vast majority of folks who get into crypto realize that the more you get into crypto, the more you realize you don't know <laughs> a lot about crypto because there's such a vast amount of knowledge. It's like when you first get into crypto, you think you know everything and you're just an unconscious incompetent. Like you don't even know that you're incompetent in crypto. Then you get to like the conscious incompetence where it's like, oh man, there's a lot to learn. Like I consider myself there. Like I'm aware that there is so much more learning to do, but that excites me because it, it gives me so much to read and research every day. I love it. Uh, and, and, and this was one of them. Okay. Now you might think this person was a little fuddish, uh, but they had a little, uh, they had a very unique perspective about when you want to invest in crypto as a hedge and when you don't want to use crypto as a hedge. And I thought this was very, very unique. So it's worth talking about. Now for a quick message from our sponsor. Thank you to Otis for sponsoring today's video. Otis is a stock market for cultural assets where almost anyone can buy and sell shares of collectibles. Items like trading cards, sports collectibles, sneakers, comics, paintings, all trade on Otis. And here's how it works. Otis releases new drops of collectibles to choose from weekly. You can buy shares of these drops or you could buy shares of old drops on their secondary market. See, right now they have over 100 rare items to choose from and that's because they have a secondary market. The secondary market is really neat because it gives you liquidity in case you buy a new drop and want to be able to sell that collectible or share of collectibles on the secondary market. Also, Otis gives you all of the information that you need to make a smart investment, like the origin or cultural significance of a piece of art. Of course, doing your own research is always critical as well, but in the meantime, Otis makes investing in collectibles easy because you can invest in shares of collectibles, including NFTs. So check out the app linked below and sign up for free. That way you can follow the weekly drops and choose the collectibles that you want to invest in. Some of my favorite drops on Otis right now are a PSA 10 Charizard card, and they even have a crypto punk. This means using Otis, you can have fractional ownership for as little as a dollar in NFTs or Pokemon cards. So take a look at this. Uh, well, actually, you know what? I'm just gonna jump to the bottom line on this. You can kind of pause the screen here and read a little bit of the backstory, but a lot of this was a backstory here. I think what's most important is, let's just look at the summary here. So the summary of this person's opinion piece, it was an opinion piece in Bloomberg. This was written by Aaron Brown. He's the head of research at AQR Capital. And this was his summary. His summary was first, you should buy crypto if you think the dollar is going down or into the toilet. And he believes that a drunken Congress can lead the dollar to collapse. And you can pull up the, the value of the dollar by looking at for relative value of the dollar by looking at the DXY chart. I'll pull that up in a moment, but I wanna explain drunken Congress. So uh, their argument of what a drunken Congress is, is this, is that Democrats like to raise taxes and spend. Republicans like to cut taxes, but they don't cut spending as much. And he believes that right now we're in the state where you kind of have nothing. Like Democrats can't do anything, Republicans can't do anything. But Republicans have a good chance of winning power in 2022, at least in one of the houses of Congress, which would mean we would need some kind of bipartisan action to actually get anything done in Congress. And when you have Republicans and Democrats working together, you tend to get more spending, less tax uh, or, or less uh, less spending cuts. So again, more spending, which is inflationary, less spending cuts, which is inflationary, 
potentially tax cuts, which is inflationary. Uh, and, and usually you don't get as many raised taxes when you get this coalition here. So he's basically saying you have a lot of inflationary pressures uh, when you have this drunken Congress. That is when you get bipartisanship between Republicans and Democrats, it's actually good for crypto, which if you look back at the last year and a half, a lot of the bipartisanship between Democrats and Republicans led to the three stimulus packages and virtually on every single stimulus package, we hit new highs when we got this crazy amount of spending of our government, right? And it also weakened the dollar, which again, you can look at the strength of the dollar because crypto globally is really denominated in, in relative terms to the dollar. Uh, and if you look at the dollar chart here, you could see that every time we took stimulative, stimulative action, the dollar weakened, right? So over here in April, we passed our first massive stimulus package, boom, uh, the dollar weakens. We pass our next stimulus package in December, the dollar hits an all time low. We pass our next stimulus package in, uh, in, in January, the dollar remains at an all time low. Uh, and it kind of vacillates then later, but every time we stimulated and government had their sort of bipartisan efforts, we, we saw the dollar fall to new level, low levels. Uh, and, and that consistently is at least deemed to be something that leads people to fly into crypto because they see a weakening dollar as a hedge uh, or they see crypto as a hedge to a weakening dollar. So if you think the dollar is going to keep failing or, the, or maybe not necessarily continue to fail because it's actually been strengthening lately, but if you think that the dollar is going to weaken in the long term, buy crypto. If you think we're going to get more monetary stimulus because the economy is weakening. So this is like your economy is slowing down. He actually argues you should buy real estate and not crypto. So if the economy is shrinking and slowing down, he says the last thing that you want to be exposed to is a startup. And he compared crypto to kind of like being a venture capital investor without needing to be an accredited investor. So like you want to invest in the next startup. Hey, look, that's great when the economy is booming, but startups suck when GDP is declining and the economy is shrinking and crypto acts a lot like a risky startup. So if you, th if you think that GDP is going to decline and our economy is going to slow down, probably stay away from crypto was his argument. If you think the dollar is going to lose power, that's where you want to get into crypto. If we have a war, he says buy crypto. So he's got a lot of reasons for buying crypto. So war by crypto, dollar loses power by crypto, financial conflict by crypto. Supply, so this would be like banks having over leveraging issues or collapse risks, right? 2008 style risk, uh, which is really what created crypto anyway. Uh, supply chain issues. So for supply chain issues, interestingly, he thought that if you are investing in crypto as a way to hedge against inflation risks, but you think the only reason that we're having inflation is because of shorter term supply chain issues, then maybe you don't want to be in crypto. And the reason for that uh, is, is again, going back to that venture capital style speculativeness is that, hey, if that temporary inflation, and uh, that's like a, a hot tamale to talk about right now, but if that supply chain inflation goes goes away, then, then you might lose some of the benefits of, of using crypto as an inflation hedge as inflation potentially goes down. Now, in theory, uh, that would mean the worst case scenario would be supply chain issues going down the, uh, and then all of a sudden, so we, we get inflation going down. So inflation goes down, but on top of inflation going down, you also potentially have GDP going down. Maybe as you turn into this sort of deflationary spiral, this in theory would then be the worst case scenario for crypto. Like best case scenario for crypto would actually be inflation going up and GDP going up, right? Startups are good when GDP goes up, inflation uh, goes up, which is good for, for crypto, right? Worth noting. Uh, it's also worth noting that I just ran a poll and just as many of you seem to invest in a crypto as a way to protect your dollar's value as a hedge against inflation, which it's worth noting those are different things, right? The dollar's value is relative to other currencies. The uh, amount of inflation we have is how much prices are actually going up. And, and take a look at this. I ran this poll on Twitter. What's the number one reason you invest in crypto? First of all, 51% of you just invest in crypto because prices trend up, which <laughs> is probably not the best reason to invest in something.
<laughs> in, in fairness, trends can change, okay? Like, trends do not have to continue, but, but in, hey, you know what? Then again, a lot of people invest in the S&P 500 because stonks go up. <laughs> uh, but then again, if you take out the top 10 uh, companies in the S&P 500, the S&P 500 is lower than where it was before the pandemic. Kind of crazy. Uh, and then, of course, you guys are matched, guys and gals, are matched between investing in crypto as an inflation hedge and a hedge against the end of fiat, which would be, you know, dollar collapse, right? Uh, so it kind of really ties into what we're seeing here. And then uh, if the economy is stagnant, uh, then, then again, you also don't, well, we already talked about that. You don't necessarily want to invest in crypto. So th that was kind of interesting. Now, I do want to mention, uh, I so I put a little Kevin note in here. We had the highest inflation re reading, like in the last 39 years on Friday, and crypto fell. Why? Because crypto tends to consistently fall on CPI days. Now, you'd think when we have these high inflation reports, crypto would, would go up, but that's not when crypto goes up. So there's not really a, a, a great link between CPI going up and like Bitcoin or the other cryptos going up. If anything, it's the opposite. It's when we get these high reports. I almost wonder if folks are, are uh, trading crypto as, as a potential uh, risk asset that they're trying to escape. Uh, to some degree, when we get these high CPI reads, because we think that, uh-oh, well, if rates go up, then maybe that means cheap money is going to go away and, and potentially crypto goes down. So that's another thing that's worth noting is every time we get these CPI reports, ironically, they come in high and crypto tends to fall. That could be because the beta uh, between, I can't draw beta very well, but anyway, the, the beta uh, between the, the NASDAQ and uh, crypto is actually increasing. And what that means is that if if you have a beta of one and the NASDAQ goes down 1%, then you would expect crypto go down to go down 1%. Uh, that We're getting closer to one between the NASDAQ and crypto. So crypto is trading more like a tech stock than, than it ever has before. And that relationship has doubled over the last few months, which is also quite interesting. Uh, so anyway, uh, then some other information that's worth noting is that uh, in Myanmar, the National Unity Government, which has been recognized by uh, France, and this government has offices, uh, not officers, well, I guess they also have officers, but anyway, offices in the US, UK, France, the Czech Republic, Australia, and South Korea, uh, they have come to recognize Tether as uh, their currency of choice. And they are doing so to prevent government seizure of their money and increase privacy. It is common to peg to the US dollar as well if you have an uncertain or, or like unstable currency. And uh, this all comes, uh, it, it's also worth noting that they're not technically the government in power right now. Uh, this comes after the current regime took power via coup d'etat back in uh, early 2020. Now a military junta runs Myanmar and so this national unity government is kind of like a shadow government that's trying to operate outside of the military junta, and they're using Tether to try to create a government. Uh, the official central bank of Myanmar has actually banned crypto, but again, this shadow government is like, F the government, F the central bank, F the military. We're creating our own government, and we're using Tether, which kind of surprising. Like, I'm a little surprised they wouldn't use USDC, which is a little bit potentially more um, backed, <laughs> right? Latest research suggests that a tether might only be somewhere between 20 to 30% actually backed by like treasury bonds or cash. And the rest are, uh, it can frequently be just any kind of speculative corporate asset, which could be, uh, you know, in, in theory, it could be junk corporate bonds, you know, leveraged loans, whatever. Now, another thing that's worth noting in, in just sort of the pain regime right now is you do have a lot of institutional investors investing in crypto. And when you have a lot of institutional investors investing in crypto, especially Bitcoin and Ethereum, which Ethereum lately has become a lot more popular for institutions, uh, but either way, both of them very, very popular. You do have Bloomberg frequently reporting that uh, Bitcoin seems to be heading to about 40,000. Now that could be straight up FUD or they could be right. But no matter, the more they say it, the more you have institutions reading this. And I just want to let you know what the institutions are reading. They're reading Bloomberg saying we're going to 40. Uh, whether or not that'll happen, I, I, I don't know, but it's just worth noting that. I also think that a lot of this comes off of the backs of uh, Federal Reserve fears. Because look, again, we, we know the Fed is going to be accelerating their taper this week, or at least we expect that. 
which could lead to rates going up sooner. Uh, and again, when you have rates going up sooner, you kind of have this like disaster that happens. So let's let's draw that out really quick. So rates uh, go up. What happens when rates go up? Well, your GDP might fall, right? GDP might fall. And so the goal of obviously increasing rates is to try to get inflation to go down. But in doing so, you crimp business uh, borrowing potentially, which could reduce, uh, and even consumer borrowing, which could reduce GDP. And remember what this author mentions. He says, look, if GDP goes down uh, and then you potentially over uh, over tighten and you go into a deflationary environment, well, now you're in your worst case scenario. Inflation goes down and GDP goes down. Uh, right? That would be bad. <laughs> That's bad for crypto. So it's possible the market's trying to incorporate like, dang it, if inflation doesn't flex down, that's why we go down with CPI releases. If inflation does go down and at the same time we over tighten, then we could have a slowed down economy and that's doubly bad for crypto. That could be a little bit of what we're seeing right now. Uh, some other news, and, and this is on Solana specifically, which I'm just going to grab Solana here really quick on... Uh, what do we got here? Weeble. Solana has broken hardcore my 186 support level that I had drawn for it. Uh, now, I don't have many other levels drawn for Solana. Uh, we could probably uh, try to do those together, but I don't know how worth it is right now. Uh, a lot of the pain, though, aside from doing some more TA here on uh, on Solana, a lot of the pain here on Solana right now is coming because, and we're down 9%, it's coming not only because of the same reason, I mean, look, Ethereum's down 8%, so it's not like it's down substantially more, right? But a lot of this is coming because of uh, the problems that we had on Thursday. And that is another, another, another DDoS attack on the Solana network, which is not very ideal. So on Thursday, we had a DDoS attack that slowed the network. And uh, this, this has led to a lot more GitHub submissions for Solana, which some folks are saying, hey, there, there are more GitHub sub submissions or, or you know, change submissions for Solana because you're having problems. Others are saying it's because Solana is just beating out Cardano and uh, Polkadot, which if only I could spell right when I type here on, on the iPad, but whatever. Uh, and so you've got a lot more Solana submissions, which some people are seeing that as a bullish sign. Others are saying, well, it's because there are more problems. And the latest problem really had to do with another DDoS attack that slowed the nat network. It's worth noting the following. Uh, in October, I did a video on Solana. And in October, you needed 18 entities on the Solana network to get you to a 33% network consensus. And this is a, a very important threshold. This is compared to Ethereum, where you have about seven or eight validators that you need to get to about 33% consensus, which implies that Solana is more decentralized than Ethereum. Uh, or uh, the uh, the 10 on Polygon, where all of a sudden you get to 63% control when you have the top 10, which is crazy. Like, that's not very decentralized, right? This is sort of your classic Solana argument to say, look, Solana is more decentralized. But the problem is every time we have these DDoS attacks, just like kind of we had in September when we had uh, an attack that, that led the entire network to shut down for 17 hours, and then all of a sudden enough validators got together to decide together to restart the network, it, it leads a lot of people to wonder and question, wait a minute, how decentralized is Solana actually? Because even though we might have 18 entities that uh, get us to 33% consensus, which implies it's decentralized, what if you actually have a lot of these entities that are controlled and owned by the same groups of people? Then, then you actually have less decentralization than it appears, right? Uh, it, it's also important to remember that Solana is a level one protocol. It's not like built on top of Ethereum. Uh, and anytime you have a level one solution, you potentially, uh, and you're creating a new one, you potentially create stability concerns because you're, you're really creating a new blockchain tech. And uh, remember that Solana uses proof of history. Proof of history, I wrote it over here, just so you can have a recollection of it. It's a system that encodes timestamps into transactions before they're sent to the blockchain, allowing the blockchain to calculate thousands of transactions at the same time without worrying about trying to figure out what the order of the transactions is because each transaction already has a timestamp and they're basically by default ordered. And this allows Solana to work more quickly, in theory, more efficiently and, and cheaper. Uh, but again, this, uh, this, this attack is not so good and has led Grayscale Investment to write the following, the Solana consensus mechanism uses a new blockchain tech that is not yet widely used and may not function as intended. There may be flaws in cryptography underlying the network, including flaws that affect the functionality of the Solana network or that make it more vulnerable to attack. And unfortunately, that's a little bit of what we're seeing right now. So, uh, you know, 
Uh, I think this is just growing pains uh, for Solana. I'm personally not heavily worried about it. Although the only investment I have right now uh, is twofold. One, uh, Axie teams, about 40K in Axie teams, probably worth a little less right now. Uh, and another in uh, Ethereum. Uh, I'm really watching right now the dip very, very closely. So that way, uh, once I feel like we've bottomed, I want to have a very diversified portfolio. And I kind of want to have like a nice pie where I've got a little bit of, you know, Dot, a little bit of uh, Terra Luna, a little bit of uh, Solana, whatever, right? And so I'm working on those allocations. Of course, anytime I buy or sell, I send alerts to everyone in the Stocks and Psychology of Money group, uh, whether it's crypto or stocks. Probably won't be crypto forever in the Stocks and Psychology of Money group, but I imagine for at least the next three months or so. Uh, but stocks, at least uh, for the time being, uh, no no plans to stop those alerts. But anyway, you can you can check out all of my programs that I have on Building Your Wealth, link down below, using the new Xmas uh, coupon code that we have for Christmas coming up. But uh, yeah, there, there you go. This is sort of an overarching update in terms of crypto for me. Uh, what I would say in terms of BTC pricing is, is we really want to watch this level here. Because look, we have been watching consistently this laddering down to new lows here. Remember when we were dancing between 56 and 58 and now we're dancing at, at this support? I'm nervous that if Bloomberg's right, we're, we're going to be soon dancing around uh, the 37 to 36 range. I hope not, uh, because I, I do think that this is going to drive more liquidations, and you're going to have substantially more people upside down on their crypto purchases, which uh, is not good because then it leads to more paper handing. Like everybody's a diamond hander when when you're still up, right? Like people are like, oh, the market's down, but don't worry, I'm still up. Or, or it's like kind of like the classic thing that people always say. It's like, oh, uh, somebody says crypto's crashing. And then they're like, what are you talking about crypto's crashing? 5% down on BTC, just a normal Monday. But it, that becomes a problem when like every single day is just a normal Monday and it's a normal Tuesday, it's a normal Wednesday. And as you keep going down, five, 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 right? Now, again, the broader market is selling off as well. So this is no skin off of just crypto. I mean, look, Tesla's down 5.6 freaking percent right now. You know, SoFi literally just broke support. It's down at 14 freaking dollars. And they broke, a, they broke a major support line. So you got some serious pain happening in the market right now. Real sort of risk off happening right now. But uh, anyway, these are some of my thoughts about crypto. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it helpful, consider sharing the video. And folks, we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye.